It's been a very interesting area of research to get into, looking at these little small RNAs, because it turns out um, that they do a lot of different things, both in plants and in animals. And one area of research that has really captured my imagination um, has taken us into the realm of epigenetics. Um, so it turns out that these little small RNAs can guide various proteins in a plant cell, um, either to chew up RNA molecules, that's how we got the virus resistance and the gene silencing in the transgenic plants, uh, but they can also um, guide another set of um, proteins in the cell so that they add what you might think of as a molecular decoration to the DNA um, in the cell. So you're not changing the sequence of the DNA, you're just adding a methyl group onto some of the cytosine residues. And the importance of that is that twofold. Firstly, adding a methyl group to the cytosines often results in a gene being silenced, number one. And number two, um, when the DNA replicates, the pattern of methyl groups that is on one strand um, can get copied onto the new strand after the replication. So this means um, that you've got RNA uh, directing the addition of these methyl groups onto the DNA, and it's silencing genes, and the silencing effect persists through cell division. And actually, even cooler than that, and this was actually one of the, I think, the best experiments we've ever done in the lab, um, was when um, we used plants that had got um, a, a special gene in, a, a called encoding a green fluorescent protein. So we think of this as like a traffic light gene. So when the plants are green under an ultraviolet light, um, uh, the gene is on. And when the plants are red, um, the gene is off. They're red because the chlorophyll fluorescence sort of shines through. So it's like a traffic light gene. Green means on, red means off. And what we were able to do was um, uh, to show that we could use RNA to um, switch the gene off, um, but also um, uh, switch the gene off in a way that it stayed off um, for the lifetime of the plant and in the progeny of the plant and in the progeny of the progeny and the progeny of the progeny of the progeny through several generations. So what this showed us was that, and this is epigenetics, um, so um, heritable changes um, to the expression pattern of the DNA that don't involve changes to the A's, C's, G's, and T's in the, in the DNA molecule. Um, so we've now become interested in epigenetics because small RNA has taken us there. And so we're asking questions, so we're asking questions, how does, how does the RNA actually do this? Under what circumstances does it do it? Um, and what is the impact um, on the biology of plants, and also can we use it? Uh, because you know that's what you always try and do as a scientist. So um, you might be interested in basic science, but you're always interested as well as can I do something useful with my basic science? So what we're finding is that um, this RNA-mediated epigenetic change is actually quite important in the life cycle of plants. Um, uh, when the plants are stressed, um, then it has an effect. Um, when you make hybrid um, plants, it also affects the um, performance of the offspring. It may not be in the first generation, it may be in subsequent generations. Um, and when you think about it, I mean, hybridization is a fundamental, it's what plant breeders do. Um, and so what we think is happening, and the, the, the question that we're addressing at the moment is, when plant breeders make hybrids, when they make crosses, and they get good new varieties out of those crosses, um, to what extent are the good new varieties influenced by the genetics of the hybrid, and to what extent are they influenced by the epigenetics of the hybrid? Of course, the genetics is you know, pretty important, uh, but we haven't really thought about epigenetics until now, um, and, or at least in that context. Uh, so that's one area that we're getting into. 
And we're also um, exploring the possibility of, so thinking about application, of developing epigenetically modified plants. So the idea here is that, let's say you've got a plant in it, uh, and it's got a gene which you'd like to um, silence. So it's a gene which, let's say, has an adverse effect on the flavor of, of the plant, or the ripening characteristics, or whatever. So you might decide that it would be a good idea to um, knock that gene out, as it were, for it not to be expressed. So what we now know how to do is using RNA, we can target an epigenetic modification to that gene. So the gene is not expressed, and the gene will not be expressed in the progeny of that plant and the progeny of the progeny. Um, so um, you've got a plant that is exactly the same as the starting variety. The DNA sequence, all of the A's, C's, G's, and T's are unmodified from the original starting variety, uh, but it's got a few extra methyl groups on um, some of those um, the cytosines in the, in the DNA. Um, and as a consequence, um, the plant will have been improved. It will not express this gene that you want to knock out. So I'm hoping that very shortly we'll be putting in an application um, to um, the regulatory authorities to find out what they think about epigenetically modified plants. They've got reams of regulations about genetically modified plants, um, but they don't yet have anything on epigenetically modified plants. And I'll be very interested to see how it comes out. You could argue that, you know, these are not genetically modified, so we should just be able to put them out in the field without any regulation at all. Or um, you may take the view um, that this is a technology that is new and not fully understood, and so you want to um, tread carefully. And who am I to say how this discussion should work out? I mean, actually, what I want to do is to have that discussion um, and see where, where we find ourselves at the end of it.